The fact is the path. Meditation comes last. First you develop right view, right resolve, preliminary wisdom, discernment, and then you work on your precepts. And even before that, the Buddha recommends that you practice generosity. There's a lots of things you can learn about the mind, lots of things you can learn about the Dharma by practicing generosity and virtue and bringing the right attitude toward them, not being forced to do these things. In fact, that's one of the main lessons of generosity. It's something that you have the choice to do of your own free will. It's something that's yours. It can be either a material object or your time, your energy, your knowledge. And you decide to share it with someone else. Not when you're forced. That's not generosity. It's when you're not forced. It teaches you an important lesson that you do have choices. You're not totally driven by, by your defilements, by greed or anger or delusion. You have some moments of clarity, and you can act on them, and it makes a difference. So it teaches you an important lesson about the Dharma, two important lessons about the Dharma. One is you can't learn about the Dharma without giving. As the Buddha once said, there's no way you're going to attain any of the higher attainments, get into good concentration, if you're stingy. So there's no Dharma without generosity. There's no Dharma without karma. I keep running into this again and again. People who want to be told that the reason they're suffering has nothing to do with them, it's somebody else's fault. That the world is basically good as it is, and you just kind of relax into the goodness of the world, and that's all you have to do. But the Buddha never taught like that. If there's going to be goodness in the world, it has to start with your giving something. Giving your time, giving your energy, giving the things that you have control over, and learning about your mind that way. You could create a good environment in which to practice, gain a sense of self-esteem. As John Sawat once noticed, that if you come to the meditation without practice and generosity and virtue, you tend to be pretty grim about the practice. You don't learn the lesson from generosity, that counterintuitive lesson, which is there's happiness that comes from giving away. And you learn about your own mind, what's going on in the mind, and how you can overcome your own stinginess. This, the Buddha said, is one of the hallmarks of wisdom and discernment, is that if you see something that may be unpleasant to do, but you know it's going to give good results, you know how to talk yourself into doing it. Conversely, if there's something you like doing, but you know it's going to give bad results. You know how to talk yourself out of doing it. Generosity gives you practice in this. Virtue gives you practice in this as well. Virtue is actually another kind of gift. You give the gift of safety. And you also learn the virtues of restraint. That's the happiness that comes from not doing just whatever comes into your mind. Or not doing just what you would like to do. There are things you realize, like, I do this even though I like doing it or I would like to do it, but it's going to cause trouble. You can stop yourself. And again, there's a sense of responsibility that comes with that. Dharma comes with responsibility. If you take responsibility for your actions, then you're going to be able to learn the Dharma. Yesterday I was in a conversation with a man who insisted the only way that he could live with other beings, other human beings who had different opinions from his, was to believe that they didn't have any choice. Of course, that meant that he didn't have any choice in his good opinions. He just felt grateful to some outer power that was giving him all the right opinions. And there's no way you're going to be able to develop in the Dharma that way. 
You have to take responsibility for your actions. If there are any things you've done in your past that were unskillful, okay, you have to admit that, yes, you did that and it's going to have an effect. You take responsibility for that. You're mature enough to take responsibility. And then you take responsibility for making things better, both inside and outside. So these are some of the ways in which generosity and virtue are actually ways of training the mind and getting it prepared for concentration. Specifically with virtue, you learn about mindfulness and alertness. You decide you're going to follow a certain precept and you realize it is a good precept to follow. And you have to keep it in mind, otherwise you slip back into your old ways. John Fuang had a student who saw that her friends were taking the Eight Precepts, so she decided to come to the monastery and practice the Eight Precepts as well. And one day, after, pretty well after noon, she was walking past the guava tree behind one of the huts there at the monastery. And before she knew it, there was a guava in her mouth. And John Fuang happened to walk, walk by and say, well, what about your Eight Precepts? What's that guava doing in your mouth? It was only then that she realized that she had broken a precept. I mean, talk, talk about lack of mindfulness and alertness. They said, you really have to look after one precept, okay? But you have to look after your mind. And that doesn't mean you don't observe the eight precepts. It means that when you're going to observe the precepts, you have to keep watch over your mind. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? What should you be doing? So as you develop the precepts, you're getting basic lessons in mindfulness, alertness, ardency, which are the qualities you have to bring to your meditation. So the practice of generosity and virtue are an important part of the meditation. They teach you the right values. In other words, they teach you some wisdom. As the Buddha said, wisdom begins with that question, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? The wisdom there lies in the fact that you realize happiness comes as a result of your actions. Suffering will come as a result of your actions, too. So you have to learn how to act. And also you're looking for long-term as opposed to short-term. So wisdom and virtue grow out of that. At the same time, they create a good environment for the meditation, both inside and out. If you're living a virtuous life, other people are not going to want to bother you. And at the same time, you're creating a good environment around yourself in lots of different ways. And you're creating a good environment inside, too. There's a sense of self-esteem, a sense of responsibility, maturity that come from these practices. And this is something we don't get. In in the world of privatized dharma, where they just teach you a meditation technique and send you home, and don't ask you to change the way you've lived your life, and don't ask you any questions about how you've lived your life, or ask you to ask questions about how you've lived your life. But for the practice to grow, you've got to have this added dimension. If you behave irresponsibly in the course of the day or thoughtlessly, you're going to carry those attitudes into the meditation. If you believe in the basic principle of dharma without karma, i.e. there's everything is just a oneness and all you have to do is relax into the oneness and everything's going to be okay, you're not going to look into your responsibility for how things are or how you can make things better. And that's actually what the meditation is all about. The mind needs improving. It needs to develop its mindfulness, its alertness, its ardency. It's concentration, it's discernment. But these are things that can be developed. So remember, as you leave the meditation, how you live the rest of the day is going to have a huge impact on the next time you meditate. We all look to the meditation to have a good impact on the rest of our lives. But it's not going to happen unless you actually try to carry these qualities into your daily life. 
at that retreat where John Swat noticed that people who didn't have much background in, in the precepts were pretty grim about the meditation. At the end of the retreat, when he was asked, you know, how do we carry the meditation in a daily life, he talked about the precepts. And a couple of the people got really upset, as if he were saying, well, you're lay people and you can't really meditate in daily life to content yourself with the precepts. But that's not what he was saying. It's by observing the precepts that you bring mindfulness and ardency and alertness, concentration and discernment into your life. You find there are challenges. You make up your mind you're not going to kill anything, and then all of a sudden there are pests in your house. What are you going to do? You make up your mind you're not going to lie. Someone asks you a question that you know if you told them the truth straight out or told them the whole truth, there'd be trouble. What are you going to do? You have to learn how to use your ingenuity in order to maintain your precepts. So all the qualities that we want to develop through the meditation get their start with the act of generosity and with your decision to take the precepts and follow them through. The Dharma comes from giving of yourself. The Dharma comes from taking responsibility for your actions. There is no Dharma without karma. These lessons apply to every aspect of the practice.